and good morning gosh I'm looking at the list of participants here good afternoon and good evening we've got a wonderful list of registrants here today so thank you for joining us um, this is our first webinar for the Kaira Association here in Asia of 2023 um, which is a great way to kick off um, to our members always good to see you here on the line thank you for your support um, to those candidates that are getting ready for their March exams happy studying you've got this one and good luck for your exams when they come through and indeed to that wider community who we work with, we're really excited to have you here with us today to learn more about the different things that the Kaya Association are working on. Happy New Year too. We've just come through the um, one of the New Year's, the Chinese New Year's coming up, but a warm welcome and all the very best for the year ahead. Now content is something that sits very much at the center of the things that we focus on here at the Kaya Association, be it webinars like the one we're posting here today, our newsletters, our blog, um, our social media outreach. There's a lot of different component parts that we work on together that brings together the core of our organization, which is our curriculum. There's a whole world of original research that we craft and build ourselves internally, but also things that we do with partners. And indeed, the portfolio for the future research we published early last year was really looking at something we built together on our original research, but with some partners from around the world. What we did with this research is we recognized that from a portfolio for the future perspective, we saw how capital allocation is going to evolve. And the last 12 months has really underlined just how much evolution has happened. And there's much more ahead of that. We definitely think that low interest rate environment, tame inflation, 60-40% portfolios were actually all okay, and the bank printing presses were very much on the go, go, go. All those things have changed in the last 12 months, and a lot of different things are happening. We knew that change was required, we saw that change was needed, and then we therefore chose to think about that. And we brought in a whole list of luminaries to share their thoughts and their views, alongside our own here at Kaya, to talk about different topics, and that came under these five marks. And during 2022, around the world, we hosted many different events physically and virtually. We weren't kind of quite back to physical events as much as we hoped to be moving forward. But one of the big topics that we um, highlighted within the portfolio for the future was this operational alpha um, and a dependency upon it. And we were very lucky to have Dr. Ashby Monk from Stanford University scribe that part of our paper for us. And we're going to be hearing a good deal from Ashby on this over the course of our webinar today. Additionally, Teneo Partners, which is led by Josh Lucy, who's also here with us today, um, put out an excellent piece of research just back in December on leadership alpha within the private equity world. And it's something which really piqued my interest when I was speaking to Josh about it towards the end of last year. And that's how today's webinar really came about. We see much more need for data, for information, for understanding in this important area to be thought about, to be considered as we enter what is a very unusual market environment. And so today's session is going to really invite, firstly, Ashby to talk about his experiences from a um, insight perspective, given the operational alpha he is thinking about, and then actually invite Josh to share his experience and thoughts on the research that he and his team at Teneo have also put together. So maybe I will, par uh, I will pardon me, pause there. And um, what I want to therefore do is bring Ashby into the discussion. Um, Ashby, may I ask you to um, share your slides there, sir, please? I'm gonna stop sharing mine. Yeah, sure. Get that a little bit easier. But what I really think is to bring these themes, these ideas to life, the research that you have been um, conducting around this more from the LP lens, I know Josh will therefore be talking much more from the GP lens, really kind of keen to have you kick off our discussion today. And as Tracy said, we really encourage your questions, so do please share those too. After Ashby's presentation, Josh will make a presentation, and then we'll have a nice open dialogue between Ashby, Josh and myself, so I can weave your questions in then. But I will pause there. Ashby, it's an absolute delight sir, to join us. Thank you to there in the, in the past, from here in the future. Um, we'll pass across <laughs> to you to through your sessions and great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm coming to you from rainy California, uh, where, we've, where we've been living in the, 
what feels like a monsoon for the last month. Um, but uh, I'm drying here and I'm ready, I'm ready to rock and roll. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're gonna focus on leadership, um, wh which is a topic I'm really passionate about because so much of um, the business of institutional investment requires true leadership to drive change. So I'm gonna talk to you about operational alpha. I'm gonna talk to you about role models like the Yale model, like the Canadian model. Um, but really it all comes down to um, individuals, human beings deciding to be different uh, and to lead internally and within their industry, within their peer group and change the way they combine um, their organizational capabilities. So I'm, at, I'm from Stanford. My program is on long-term investors. So I acknowledge most of the work I do is, is on the asset owner side, what we might think of as the LP, um, the long-term investor, uh, the pension fund, the sovereign fund, the endowment foundation, that's my area of expertise. And, and I focus on the design governance of management of those organizations. Um, and here we're talking about operational alpha um, as a foundation um, of delivering out performance. If you were going to ask most chief investment officers of these organizations, what is the biggest contributor to performance? I think most of the time you would hear asset allocation. They would point you to the, the famous Brinson paper that said 93.5% of the variability in quarterly performance is a function of asset allocation. Um, and, and that's not incorrect. I would simply say it misses part of the um, foundation that facilitates asset allocation, and that's organizational capabilities. So you can't set asset allocation in a vacuum. If you want to build a direct investment program for private equity, you better have pretty fabulous process, um, highly paid people, a culture of risk taking. There's a whole series of issues that folds around the organization, which we're going to talk to today. So ultimately, my argument here is that you may see asset allocation as a driver of returns. You may see your implementation model as a driver of returns. And by that, I mean, are you investing directly in assets? Are you investing through managers, through fund to funds? Are you working with consultants to select your managers? These are all different implementation models that actually have material impacts on performance, but also exposures and risks and diversification, all these things that an allocator needs to pull together. And so that asset allocation model and that implementation model are both um, predicated on sophisticated capabilities. And that's really what I mean when I talk about organizational alpha. I mean those capabilities. It's not just the boring stuff like, do you do due diligence? Do you have a sophisticated risk team? You know, are you tracking your um, your your benchmarks tightly? You know, is there little tracking error? Things like that. That's part of the organizational capability and the operating alpha. But I think I don't think it does justice to what we mean when we say we are adopting the Yale model or we're adopting the Canadian model of institutional investment. Um, when we think of a lot of models, oftentimes we revert back to different categories of asset owners. Oh, I'm a family office, or I'm a pension fund. And we hope that that communicates to managers, to stakeholders, to people around the world, um, the style of investment that we're pursuing. But actually, in, in terms of understanding what an asset owner investor is doing, we generally don't think of these categories. You can look at a foundation um, like the Wellcome Trust and say, oh gosh, that's a lot like Yale's endowment. And Yale's endowment maybe was the inspiration for the future fund of Australia. You know, there's different aspects here that cut across these categories. And so you start to see people like me talking about um, identities, role models. There's the Norway model for sovereign wealth funds. It's the good governance model that people around the world have been talking about as a role model for sovereign wealth funds run out of the central bank, overseen through the Ministry of Finance, Yale model, Canadian model. You know, the economists wrote about the maple revolutionaries redefining implementation of portfolios. That's really what the Canadian model is about. Not so much that it's wildly more diversified than other organizations in the world. It's that they were going direct and removing intermediaries 
and getting a um, more aligned exposure to the underlying assets that they needed in order to deliver on their performance targets. My favorite one is when you see um, Canadian pension funds adopting the Dutch model. So now we're really getting confusing. We've got endowments adopting the Canadian model. I might argue Harvard in the 2000s was running a Canadian model. Now they're running an endowment model. Who knows what's going on up there? So I want to explain some of all this coming together. And there are new models that are emerging. The collaborative model is a new one. I would argue today APG is pursuing the technologized model. And all of these different models, they signify different ways of combining their organizational capabilities. And these organizational capabilities are always, nearly always unique because the funds come from different locations around the world. They have different sponsors. They have different liability profiles, on and on and on. And so every fund is gonna have some different components when thinking about designing the model. And it takes a leader to select the appropriate model for the organizational capabilities. And on top of that model, begin to design a asset allocation plan. How much risk do we need to take to deliver a set of return uh, streams and implementation model. And here is just a series of these models. The Canadian model I've mentioned already, it's about implementation. It's predicated on something called the Crown Corporation, um, which allows for a double arm's length governance structure which allows the Canadian pension plans to compensate incredibly well, to push delegations down to the portfolio managers, to really run these organizations like quasi-commercial professional investment organizations. People are making in the you know millions of dollars working for public entities in the Canadian context. Collaborative models, a newer model, I would suggest that it was Calsters and uh, the University of California that kind of invented this, this model, but it's more about um, combining um, all of the capabilities together in a way that allows for innovation and flexibility, recognizing that the world is changing around us and innovation is a very hard thing for pension funds to do. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but you know, Chris Aylman and Calsters and Jaggi Bashir at University of California really sought to drive innovation. We've talked about Norway, everybody knows the Yale model, also known as the endowment model, also known as the Swenson model. David Swenson really drove the endowment model into the future by understanding the capabilities that Yale possessed and building an asset allocation and implementation model that was unique. Again, what I'm describing in terms of models is ultimately about the foundation of asset allocation. And I've been talking in too much abstract terms, so let's actually talk about what I mean. It's hard to generalize across these investors because I've already said they're all different, but actually every investor does the same thing. You give them capital, that capital comes with a whole set of characteristics and encumbrances. That capital could be long-term, it could be big, it could be small, it could be a mature pension plan, which means we need to pay out a lot every year. It could be a accumulating plan, which means we're not paying a lot. The capital components of this production function are critical, as is the capital on the right, which is the goal. So we understand the constraints on the left and the goal on the right, and every single investor I've ever come across then combines these three things. They need people, those people can be internal, they can be consultants, they could be placement agents, they could be any number of things, but you need people. Then you need information. People use information to make decisions. Then with that, information and people, you need to run a process to actually allocate the capital to achieve your objectives. That process may come under the name of investment committee. It may be a delegation framework. It may be a str strategic asset allocation framework. But this is the framework upon which people start to think about the operations of investment, the foundations of differentiating and delivering alpha. And we did a project in 2018, uh, Professor Gordon Clark and myself at Oxford, um, where we went and we looked at 20 organizations around the world. And we said, okay, well, we understand that everybody's trying to take their capital, their process, their people, and their information and improve it. This was about improving their operations to deliver higher performance. And what we learned was that there's governance, culture, and technology at the center of every organization's ambition to drive performance. 
You need new technology, which means new analytics data, if you want to invest in private equity. Why? Because you're setting a pacing model. That pacing model will extend from today for five years. You actually are setting a pacing model for the entire organization that needs to link into the unfunded commitments you have, the liquidity profile, the cash. All of these little aspects actually allow an organization to go from 5% in private equity to 15% in private equity. It doesn't happen without the technology. It probably doesn't happen without a governance change or a cultural change. And so all of these aspects come together to allow an organization to develop its unique identity and to develop its own model. And if you deliver true out performance with that model, then you get the ability to be a role model. That's why we talk about Yale. That's why we talk about Canada. We talk, we're starting to talk about the Australian model. We're starting to talk about the Dutch model. These are the models of institutional investment that organizations around the world are saying, how do we deliver operational alpha? Well, let's pull a little bit from APG and the Dutch model. Let's look at the Swedish model and the AP funds. Let's pull a little bit from the endowment model and let's put our own twist on it. Now we have a model. And ultimately this is about outperformance. You want to outperform your peers, benchmarks, the industry in pursuit of alpha. And originally, the Canadian model didn't exist. It was Claude Lam Lamoureux in 1990, I think, who came in to be CEO of the newly formed Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. And he was CEO for 17 years until 2007. You could argue that he built the Canadian model in the same way that Swenson built the endowment model. And these were attempts to improve access to underlying assets. They were attempts to improve alignment of interests. Um, so if I win um, and my manager wins, we're all winning. We don't want managers making money when I'm not making money was kind of the underlying logic. Maybe we new, need new capabilities. So we're gonna change our model. Obviously we want high performance. We want, maybe we want better sustainability. These are all issues that we see today and over the last 20 years that have pushed organizations to tweak their model, to take their governance, their culture, and their technology, and to augment their people, process, and information, and capital. But not just augment, maybe combine them differently. Oh, we're now doing co-investment with our GPs. That's a change to your model of investment, to your implementation, to your asset allocation, and you need to build a foundation in order to do that. I know I'm talking very quickly, but hopefully you can watch this on half speed later and, and get all the details. Here's why leadership is important. It's important because you can look at your organization and you can say, I'm sitting in Juneau, Alaska, or I'm sitting in London, England, and I have these people, this process and this information, and I wanna do something different. Most asset owners still struggle to implement new models. Innovation in this industry is incredibly difficult for good reason. We designed it that way. We wanted conservatism in this industry. This is after all the base of capitalism with a hundred plus trillion dollars, but it's also the foundation of the modern social welfare state. So we pushed conservatism on these organizations by the way, well asking them to go make seven, 8% a year, which is no small feat. So innovation is hard. They've got prudent person rules, which pushes them to herding. They Most of these organizations have monopolies over their assets. Last I checked, monopolies aren't the most innovative organizations. They're not spinning out new models of investments. Guaranteed survival does not catalyze the instinct to survive and innovate. The compensation isn't perfect. It's what I call the wounded porcupine. There's my porcupine right there. The wounded porcupine is you see these pension funds and you say, gosh, I see how I can help you. And you try to put your hands in to help them and it hurts because sometimes innovation is hard and it can be cushy to be in a monopoly. Um, I'm being very candid. Um, the governance, the consultant business is on and on and on. I don't want to spend all the entire time hogging the spotlight here with my leadership around operational alpha. Just note that innovation in these asset owners, especially at the level of the model, it's one of the hardest things you can do, usually requires a crisis. When we had the internet bubble uh, burst, we ended up with liability-driven investing in 2002-ish. That was the big boom there. Global financial crisis, we ended up with 
factor-based asset allocation as an implementation. And underneath there, you had to have new data models, new technologies, new process, all these different pieces. But it was crises that drove transformations of operating models. And the only way you can really drive change to operating models without a crisis is leadership. The leaders like Swenson, like Lamoureux, like Bashir at UCOP or Aylman at Calsters, they look at their identity here and they think to themselves, how do we change our capital base? How do we change the nature of our capital? You hear a lot of organizations uh, talking about long-term investing. They build investment beliefs. We believe that having a long-term perspective delivers out performance. What you're hearing when somebody designs investment beliefs is an attempt to use culture to change the nature of their capital and influence the process and people to push capital into longer term horizons, which is another way of saying, let's reduce portfolio churn because portfolio churn is a tax. That's a very simple way of saying it. Long-term investors also have the ability to invest in areas that no, that no others do. So all of this comes together to say, and I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A, the models of institutional investment that have become most famous are ultimately attempts at operational alpha. They are an attempt to combine these factors that you see on your screen in novel ways and to deliver capital into markets in a differentiated manner. There is no outperformance. There is no alpha without differentiation. And it starts with this little simple circle diagram that I've invented. It starts here. This is your identity as an institutional investor and it's the foundation of um, alpha but it's not useful unless you have true leaders around the table to take each of these forward. With that, whew. Woohoo, what a whistle that stop. That was fast. That was fantastic. My gosh. Big thumbs up from Josh as well. That was honestly fantastic. Thank you, Josh. Great way to set us off with such a great flow of perceptions of what the LPs need to be thinking about and what they are doing and I love that wounded porcupine I might nick that from you Ashby don't put your hand in the bucket and see what kind of comes back and gets you and I think as I'm chatting Josh and his team are going to share their slide deck from their side so Josh if you kindly pop your slides up when you're ready and yeah. um, we're now going to take our lens of focus away from that LP and that whole innovation or lack of innovation and what's happening in that LP space and Josh is going to touch on some great research he and the team at Teneo have looked at around leadership alpha. We're going to go from the LP down to the GP and the end company as well, the, the investment company too. So Josh, sir, welcome. Yeah, can you, can you see my screen? Just check that quickly. We can. We can see you loud and clear. Okay, look, so I, I think just really clearly, I think it was a really interesting um, presentation by Ashby there. And I think... The, I think it's important to distinguish a couple of things. When we talk about operational alpha, that can apply at different levels of the investment chain and the capital flow. A lot of the that Ashby was relating to is at the LP level, the asset owner level. We work as it's Taneo, we, we work at the LP level in terms of working with LPs, but more specifically to this research is more on the GP level and the interaction with portfolio companies. So. I think sort of having read the piece around portfolio for the future for um, from Kaya, there's a lot of that which focuses around creating operational alpha at the investing level, but this is lower down the chain. And hopefully the diagram I've shared um, illustrates that a little bit in terms of the slight difference in the two, but also the big opportunity to do that. Does that kind of make sense? That's a super way of, of framing it, Josh. So thank you. As you say, you're going to kind of take us into the all the world of the GPs once the money's kind of gone into their pockets and what you have found in that research that you've assembled. Great. Okay, thank you. Look, I will go through um, these slides now. Um, so I've, I've talked through the different levels and where we see the opportunity. I think let me just dive into the slides and I'll try them as quick as possible with these. Uh, there's a few bits to go through, but I think we can get through them in, in kind of 15 minutes that we've had. I think just as a recap in terms of the approach and some framing that to make sure that we're not misleading some of the audience. Um, th 
leadership is a very broad term. Again, I reinforce the fact that we specifically focused around its impact on investing performance from a GP perspective and therefore how much GPs are undertaking effort to enhance it at the portfolio company level and how much they're interacting with usually the CEO of those portfolio companies. So that was really the area of focus. I think it's important to also highlight that kind of this was a six month study. We had 25 interviews, looked at various data. That data was predominantly European, UK and Asia based, so not US centric. And of course, there is huge amounts of data variability across this huge industry. Um, and then just lastly, I'll go through the slides now, but I think it's important to distinguish, but also recognize the overlap and delineation between what we mean in terms of leadership alpha and value overall effort by GPs on value creation, on a particularly operational value creation, um, because they overlap and obviously leadership is a core component of that. But trying to distinguish the two is very, very hard, albeit we did try to explore the quantification of that. So that's kind of framing the framing that. I'll go through, you know, basically why there is a gap uh, or kind of explain that there is a gap, why there's a gap, what influences the respective funds approach to portfolio leadership. Um, basically, how are value creation approaches evolving? And there's a real spectrum. We'll touch on that. And then, you know, this is not a theoretical academic piece. This is purely around finding out where's the opportunity and how do you ultimately improve things to drive better performance? So where is the opportunity? And effectively, why is that so pertinent now with the kind of investing landscape we're currently entering? Um, look, I think if you ask a lot of people across the industry, some amazing comments at the bottom, forget some of the actual numbers at the top, but actually it's the, the comments on the bottom around that leadership is the single most important aspect of the deals that we do, and yet people diligence is the is the least developed part of that process. If you then say, because we had effectively a working thesis coming into this, saying there is a difference between the importance of leadership in, in investment returns and the effort that funds place in terms of optimizing it. And across our uh, survey, you know, the figures are there in front of you. And the actual figures are not actually that important. The important thing is there is clearly a gap and there is a recognized gap that that is the case. Um, why is there such a gap? Well, there's the old adage of kind of, if it's not broken, why fix it? Um, and I don't, you don't need to kind of talk to this audience around the success growth and performance returns of uh, private equity of certainly over the last 15 years um, to, to realize that um, yeah, they've had phenomenal success. And, and with that, firms have evolved and grown very, very quickly. But in many ways, some of their way, internal ways of working and uh, their use of technology and latest, um, uh, latest assets and tools and techniques hasn't necessarily evolved all that much. Um, with that said, uh, and in addition to that, um, the three big buckets for how LPs evaluate GPs in terms of their performance have largely been EBITDA, multiple, and net debt. Combine what's been the, the, the value creation to the underlying asset. Now, there is a larger and larger um, data set and LPs now, some of which have fantastic data sets and have real academic frameworks around do, can they quantify that and break that down even further? That's absolutely right. But over the last 15 years, you haven't really needed to if your market beta is going up 20, 25% a year or you're hitting 30% IRR. So the pressure and the um, necessity to really get granular of where performance is coming from and how that's being driven and how the GPs are helping to drive that and their role in that hasn't necessarily been um, necessary in a market which is which is growing really quickly. So the investments have been really pleasing. And as I said, just touching on the end there, in terms of legacy ways of working, 
and technology. And interestingly, you know, we recently put out a, a survey highlighting the difference between investor sentiment and CEO sentiment around their investment into disrupting technologies, and particularly the way that's utilized internally. Um, I think just in terms of two real interesting elements around, um, you know, so, sorry, this, this, sorry, I jumped a slide. So what influences relative effort? And what we found was there's a real spectrum of private equity firms and the effort they placed on leadership and consequently overall value creation. And there were some real drivers that are really being challenged and are quite pertinent in the current market, particularly with more and more PE firms listing and becoming public companies themselves. And I think it was interesting picking up on Ashby's comment about investment beliefs. And I think that an investment culture that was also then attributed lower down the chain at the GP level, where the founder DNA and the background of those individuals had a real, still has a really profound impact on the culture mission of the organization. Consequently, the investment strategy and the way that the, 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 the GP is designed internally. And we quite often found that sometimes there's a split between firms who had separate operations teams to deal teams and how people are remunerated in slightly different manner. And whilst this is a polarization, that really created a polarization. Uh, and of course, there's obviously variety in the middle between firms who are increasingly deal orientated and focused on AUM versus being performance and IRR carry orientated to beat hurdle rates, et cetera, as part of their remuneration package. And that really highlighted the difference and drove the difference around relative effort. Um, this, so this um, next page in terms of data, I think was really highlighted that in terms of how there is at the biggest level in the alternatives industry, a lot of people talked around the increasing split in the industry and a bifurcation between private equity firms who actually aren't pure private equity firms now, they're becoming multi-platform strategies, they're becoming multi-platform asset managers, and particularly when they're listed, more and more on a relative basis of their fees comes from AUM and management fees in order to pay their, their shareholders on a regular basis as dividends, rather than pure buy, improve and sell and try to be incentivized by carry. And whilst the, um, you could challenge the, um, uh, some of the data, because I mean, ideally you'd want a larger data set, but we did start to see that slight bifurcation in the data set, particularly when you look at the background of whether the founders and exec teams of these funds or these GPs came from either a banking background or a consulting background. So come back to that later. Just going really quickly in terms of, so look, there's, there's a real spectrum around how GPs do value creation. A lot of GPs talk about it. It's in their advertising material, but if you challenge them in terms of how, how is that, how do you do that and get into the real weeds, we found effectively two elements or a, or a framework of, of two elements that you could judge um, the GPs on. One was, how systematic they were or how um, codified they were in the process of, um, of creating value as part of that ownership um, of, of companies. And of course that varied depending on the, their investment strategy whether the majority ownership, minority stake, et cetera. And the other one was how involved they were. And the interesting thing is the two, the two um, ones in the top right there also had considerably higher IRR than anyone else. Um, but the interesting thing was there were a lot of, and the size of the bubbles is, is, is a reflection of AUM. The interesting thing is it doesn't necessarily, we don't necessarily have to try and do both, um, but there were successful firms in the bottom right and sex was successful firms in the top left. But the important thing is they were deliberate around their approach and it was planned. Just last point around another area of, um, value creation, which is kind of, everyone talks about 3.0, some one person coined that phrase, was moving forwards. Um, how do you create synergies across um, 
portfolio companies. And that was something people had only really just touched the side on really. So a whole different set, set of approaches there. Um, I'll, I'll try and get through the last couple of slides pretty quickly. So look, where was the biggest inefficiency? And there it was the interaction between funds and CEOs. And in many ways, it wasn't codified. And the technologies people were utilizing as part of trying to develop a more scalable um, value creation approach, really people were quite nascent in terms of their approaches to how they, what type of technologies they were using. And a couple of data points here, you know, we talk about sort of really great CEOs, people's visibility of performance below a CEO or a portfolio company's financials weren't always that, um, they weren't that holistic sometimes and relying on data sometimes months, if not half a year old. And one of the stats we found, again, you could challenge it and say we would like some more data points, but there was a general trend that the larger the GP, the slower they were to interact with CEOs and the exec teams after the first signs of underperformance. Um, and in total, people thought it was generally take 24 months to either replace it for, for a company to get back to productivity if you had to go replace a CEO. So many GPs decided we don't even want to go down that path. So there's a whole host of opportunities in that, in that space. Um, so kind of what were the solutions that we, we saw? Um, and this is kind of like, I give the analogy about playing a game of um, soccer or, or, or football or, or, or sport. But is it just a case of buying a really group, group of talented players and letting, get, letting them get on with it? Or is it a case of really coaching them, really working with them and try to hone that on a weekly basis to get better, better and better. And that really is a reflection of how the appetite of GPs or their respective appetite to actually do that. And there were three elements to that. One is really try to codify a value creation playbook in order for two things. One, to better articulate your value creation approach to LPs, to differentiate yourself and to be able to raise capital from LPs, but also why should, when there's so much capital out there, why should an investee company want you to own them and you to be part of the board and how will you help them grow and doing that in a really codified manner rather than a more opportunistic approach. The second part was around uh, reporting, performance reporting and the transparency of this. And I'm always amazed at how Sometimes the LPs could be creating more influence to say we want to see these KPIs or we want to be seeing this reporting. And, and there is still a lot of opportunity for GPs to improve that, particularly in an automated manner. And then lastly was around the, the value attribution model. If you are going to invest in ops teams, if you are going to invest in operating partners and people to work hand in hand with, with portfolio companies, then where do you actually allocate the cost to that? And how do you, how do you get granular around that model? Um, and just lastly, kind of look, coming out of a firm that kind of uh, spun out of um, helping to run the White House, um, some of the technologies which are now available to do diligence on both people and organizations is phenomenal and is far less um, labor intensive and time consuming and is, provides a massive potential competitive advantage um, than some of the traditional psychometric testing, very cognitively involved processes that some people have used in the past. I'll wrap up here just by saying, like, you know, why is this relevant now? And if you look at a couple one of the last recessions, uh, firms with dedicated or GPs with dedicated operational capability outperformed by 30%. And I don't need to speak to this audience around sort of the macro drivers of the market and, and why focusing on uh, EBITDA is now increasingly important when we're looking at challenges across margin compression, um, multiple, um, and 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 higher cost of cost of capital. And just lastly, as as we're talking through alpha versus beta, I do I do take this and say kind of you know that um, in terms of a tide sort of go, going up, we're in really interesting times, and I think everyone's aware that the benign investing environment in the last 15 years has gone and we people need to work much harder if they're going to create alpha performance and with that kind of I'll, I'll pause there and pass back to joe and ashby 
Hey, Josh, super. And I, as I say, I've read your report um, in depth. It's fantastic. So thank you so much for, for walking us through that. And Ashley just popped his kind of camera back on. So thank you. We've had a couple of um, questions come through both privately and publicly. But I love the first one that just kind of sprung up because it's really about my first question, too. So the actual um, the contributor was anonymous, but a little bit more elegant, perhaps, in my question. I'll be a little bit more direct, if I may. Ashby, does this really all matter? Are LPs really taking a step back and look? I love it. I love your reaction. You can uh, please turn on your mic. Um, you know, are LPs going to be looking at this? Just touching the same thing. That granularity of returns just hasn't been looked at. It hasn't been had to be. Headline returns have been fab. We've all gone home fat and happy. To your earlier point, some of the big LPs are earning multi-million dollar numbers. They're not going to have to worry about going back into the the private <clears throat> public space, leaving the private space. Um, does this matter? Are we going to see a big sea change? Is this the next big thing from an experience and exposure perspective? I think it is. I, I think if you go across these, or so if I said, it, how much are people talking about operational alpha? I, I think people would be right to say not, not a ton. Um, but when you go through the annual reports of these organizations and you look at how much they're talking about governance, culture, technology, how much gets uh, paid attention to the people, the stakeholders. Um, it's it's like 80% of the text in these annual reports. And and so we, we didn't even need a crisis to make this all about governance and technology. Um, I mean, a lot of these big asset owners are realizing that investments in technology allow them to really understand what they own and to plot different paths into the future, especially through volatile markets. So you don't need much um, instrumentation when the skies are blue. You can just fly your plane and, you know, what's called dead reckoning. You can just see where you're going and go land it. There's my co-author right there in case you're wondering. Uh, but, but. Porcupine kind of prongs are gonna be out, out of your hands. You're gonna be- Yeah, okay. no, that guy's, he feels great. Um, but with, instead of dead reckoning, when you've got storms around you, when you've got volatility and, and it's hard to see the destination and you're wondering, what's my liquidity profile? What's my unfunded commitments to private equity? Boy, instrumentation really matters. And so you're seeing a ton of leadership right now. And I think that's what this crisis will be about. Leadership towards the next generation investment technology. It's critical. Fantastic. I, I, I love your energy and I couldn't agree with you more. There's got to be more focus on that devil in the detail. And to that point, Josh, I mean, you're obviously your experts within that GP space and that tension between the LPs and the GPs is always there. It's healthy. It's sometimes not quite as healthy. Um, historically, I think the GPs were king in many transactions, but that seesaw has gone chunk and the LPs, I believe now, are much more driving the car. The GPs aren't yet in the trunk, but they're kind of, they're not, they're in the passenger seat at this particular point. There's been massive flows into private equity. There's much more to come if the numbers that we see out there are anything to go by. What are the GPs going to do or what are the GPs going to have to do to be better in all things around alpha, adding transparency information? What are we going to see change there? Look, it's a, it's a pretty broad question. I think there's a couple of points in there. I was really interested in talking around how even Larry Fink's talking around from the old 60-40 model moving to 50-30-20. Well, if you, just, if you look at kind of the amount of assets available, amount of product available, and the capital being raised for alternatives, I'm not sure there's enough product there for all that capital to go to find a home at the moment. So you've naturally got an asset. Um, you, you've basically got valuations being kept up in that space. And consequently, um, your returns will be a little bit less. Um, so I think that the challenge when people have been used to getting your know, high teen, even 30% IRR on a, on, a kind of, on a compound basis, which are phenomenal returns, you're going to see in the next 18 months, mark to market, some of the 17 and 18 vintages coming down sometimes like 30%. So if, if, if public equity last year, 20% odd drop, that's going to create a lot of 
I think, frustration around kind of end clients and saying, well, actually, if I'm paying you kind of very high fees and they see some of the headlines around some of the multi-millions that some people are earning, you know, what's the return I get for that? Show me, show me the return for that. And therefore, the scrutiny coming forward is going to be greater. I think with that said, I think that if you look at the waterfall from, and I go back to the capital flow from the LP, and the investment belief and the setup at the governance at the LP level through to the GP and for portfolio company level, I still think that there's a huge amount of symmetry of, of information. So what is the transparency of information going on that chain? And that asymmetry of information is allowing huge amounts of fees. If you did the waterfall to the end user and how much money is getting back, get given away at different agencies at different sections. So I think the interesting thing for LPs as well is to say everyone's chasing operational alpha, which is effectively out, out, outsized returns on the, on the top line, a top line performance. But there's as much opportunity to create operational alpha through bottom line savings on efficiency. So whether, so as LPs start to consider becoming GPs and going direct themselves, that's a really interesting space, which I think that will challenge um, some of the GPs to really sharpen their pencil and to invest more, particularly around their value add and being able to quantify that and demonstrate that, not just in terms of financials, but also moving forward in terms of other elements around sustainability, um, you know, uh, sustainable investing, ESG and so on. So being able for a GP to be able to quantify that and demonstrate that and back that up with the figures and the data, then I would say that whilst the big shops, many of them are very, they're super sophisticated, they run by very, very bright people and have a lot of this, I think, I think particularly in that mid market and for smaller funds still trying to access institutional capital, they have to try and demonstrate that to differentiate themselves and jump to that institutional scale. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I think you've made some really thoughtful points there, Josh, and sincerely so. And I think I kind of maybe put it less elegantly under that banner of kind of club deals. We're going to get back into the old fashioned world of proper communications and transparency and engagement around the table. So the LPs and the GPs coming together and collaboration for investments and sharing that detail. And, and Ashby, what are you going to, what do you think the LPs will demand? What sort of data information, what are they going to need to understand how well that GP selection they made has done? How's that going to work from a communications mm -hmm. perspective? How, how do you see that kind of evolving? I hope it evolves. I hope it evolves because right now I would say a lot of LPs feel like price takers rather than price makers and everything that goes with that for the reasons Josh mentioned, you know, there's, there's this huge overhang of capital on the LP side, searching out opportunities. Most people's um, kind of multi-asset pacing is being, the pacing is being shifted towards e-liquids and commitment-based assets and out of kind of the public equities um, for a variety of reasons, which we can skip. But, but in order to demand your GPs to report and, and prioritize all the stuff that Josh was just talking about, which I thought was fabulous to see all those details, um, you, you really need to lead the way. And, and so when you look at like Tomasek and Yale and, and some of the Canadian funds, like there's a cachet to having those LPs in your fund. They're leaders. And, and sitting in there, there's a person who's the leader who, who knows how to drive the GPs to collect the information, get the underlying portfolio data, on and on and on, and share it up into the LP. The future is see-through. The future is see-through from the asset owner through to the cash flows in the portfolio company. But there's 10 years of Excel spreadsheets to get through before we have those data feeds coming out of the accounting software and the CFO's office and the portfolio company, all the way up to the chief investment officer at the pension plan. Between now and then, there's gotta be a lot of, I mean, I keep talking about this because we're here to talk about leadership, but it's true leadership. So you're gonna have to be ready to say no to those great GPs in order to kind of capture some of these things that seem um, obvious in terms, I mean, it's like, leadership it's 
obviously good, right? Like it's obviously going to drive out performance, but it's hard to quantify. And there's a lot of this stuff for pension funds and sovereign funds where you look at it and you're like, clearly we should be managing the risk of climate change. And then here in America, we've got a bunch of states that are basically saying, don't do that. Well, it's going to take leadership for a certain rock that is of a dark color CEO uh, to continue to talk about climate change in the way that he's been talking about it with all of these politicians telling him not to. I don't know if I'm too cryptic or if people get my reference, um, but it, it's going to take leadership. Ashby, can I, Jerry, can I ask a question of Ashby? I think that the question I have is, do LPs realize how influential they are on the GP community? <laughs> I wish, so So I used to write a column called Avenue of Giants because I was literally trying to communicate to them, you are giants. You don't understand the power you have. And, and yet too many times I've seen, I won't say them by name, but chief investment officers have a private equity thanking GPs at board meetings for making an allocation to their fund. Thank you, GP, for letting me pay you two and a half and 20%. It, you know- <laughs> I, I think that part, we still need to, exactly what you just said, to say, look, LPs, you know, you, you really have the capital. You're the base of capitalism. They're the base. They got the hundred trillion. Um, but because, uh, uh, here's the great fact. You've seen that stat that 76% of private equity GPs are top quartile. Have you seen that one? <laughs> it's a real stat that Ludo... Uh, from Oxford put out because the GPs, they can cherry pick their benchmarks. They can do all this stuff. And then the LPs have to get really smart, right? They need, they need to level the playing field with data and analytics. And so if you're an LP, it can be hard to know who's actually top quartile, who's worth the fees. Um, and that's where operational alpha, now we're going back here. It's all about people, process, information, the information. And I'm smiling because I've never seen a bad back test, right? None of us have seen a bad back test. Exactly. They get put yeah. together. And, and maybe, Josh, the same kind of question thrown back to you, but in a slightly different way to some of Ashby's points is, you know, you're seeing tech adoption by the GPs. You're seeing the need to therefore assemble the data. I kind of refer to it as the investor does come first. In my opinion, that sea change I mentioned before, the investor is top of the tree. So the avenue of giants, they're there now. They have much more cash. They have much more Christian hold. But if the investors start asking the why questions of the GPs, why is this happening? How is this happening? Et cetera, et cetera. The GP is going to be ready to answer those questions. And that is expensive because it's time consuming. And uh, <laughs> And how do you think the GPs are ready or otherwise? I mean, tech's a big disruptor of calls, but what are we going to see there from the GPs to adopt the questions and provide that information? Yeah, good question. I think, again, a few points to it. But, um, I think that the, there's probably a split, as I talked around before, in terms of the bifurcation of the biggest GPs, incredibly sophisticated, big firms, but with that size and sophistication, trying to coordinate things across multiple jurisdictions, Different sector focuses. They're, they're, they're the same. They're the same challenge internally of organising themselves as any large corporate organisation. Um, so I do think that the adoption of technology and changing ways of working, and if you have to change a process internally, it's, these these things are very hard. Change it hard across any large organisation. We're all aware of that. So I think it really does depend on a couple of things. One is kind of the belief. You go back to the belief and DNA of some of the founders and the people running the organization. And I think that throws up an interesting succession planning when you consider some of the individuals exiting the industry. And the only way really to exit the industry is to IPO so they can get paid out. So, and these guys started, started in the industry some decades ago and were phenomenal deal team. They're phenomenal leaders. They knew how to run an operations team. They were just great all-rounders, whereas actually the industry has moved towards far more specificity, both in terms of skill sets, sector, and so on. So I think driving those changes internally, you would come back to the culture of what the firm's trying to be. And when you're a, when you're a listed company and you're effectively going to pay a dividend each year to your public shareholders and you are an AUM platform, that's a kind of very different motivator than if you are a standalone mid-market private equity firm or credit fund even, who are saying, look, we want to stand out to grow 
but we want to retain what we do because we're really good at what we do. And that split becomes really important. Just last point on the technology is it's only been, I mean, off the back of the 15 years, it's very hard to justify spend on technology if your, your centre forward keeps knocking, scoring goals. You go, well, actually, it's not, it's not broken, so why do I want to fix this? So again, going back to the influence that some of these people have in terms of the operating partners or the guys running the value creation teams, how much influence and what's their status internally to actually drive change? Do they have a seat at the top table at the investment committee? How much do those people listen to versus some of the deal individuals? And that becomes a really interesting thing where, do you know what, instead of doing, albeit we're investing in technology, but the way that we're using internally most firms would say that actually we're still we're still catching up but the interesting now is that i think that off the shelf technology can support the various processes of the value creation across the whole period and it's only by investing in that rather than purely just people you're going to have a scalable and affordable value creation approach if you're considering you know, I've, we spoke to clients who are going, oh, we're going to, we want to build our, multiply our portfolio by five times, but we're not multiplying our, our headcount by five times. So how do you keep, a, you know, use a film analogy, the eye of Sauron to make sure that you can actually get granular when you need to. And it's looking at lead indicators for portfolio companies in a proactive way, rather than waiting for something to default or go needing restructuring and insolvency work. Um, so you can actually act in a really proactive manner and a cost effective manner rather than just get bigger and bigger and bigger because your unit cost is just not, you couldn't pass that back to the LPs in a justifiable manner. Uh, I, I agree, you can't pass those fees back, but to Ashby's point at two and a half and 20, they're, they're getting quite fat on the actual, on the income that they're getting. So I, I think the cost of tech is something which we're gonna see a massive amount of investment um, over the coming months and years. And there's a, a fascinating amount there to unpack. And I'm very respectful of coming up to the top of the hour and I'm very aware of that. And um, in the spirit of being um, thoughtful to our audiences, they've actually all stuck, which is brilliant. I think the content that has therefore been shared has been compelling. And I think we've been able to bring to the table today a conversation around an important part of our industry, which has perhaps been lost because it's grown so quickly. We've all done well, we've all done well, why? Well, it's because, you know, performance, returns, asset allocation, but it is a much bigger discussion than that. And I think both of your presentations and both of your thoughts shared today have summed that up exceptionally well. I always have an ask, if I may, as we finish off the session, I give you each 30 seconds. And I invite you to leave us with a thought, or a soundbite, a takeaway. It can't be a wounded porcupine, Ashby. And it can't be that latent number from you, Josh, but if I can have a, a soundbite from you to take away, and while you're doing that, I'll pop up and share my screen of the slides so um, everybody knows where to find access to the um, reports you have been talking to today. And we hope to see your comments. So Ashby, sir, you first, please. Well, look, I, I've just had a blast in, uh, in in actually being an audience member here for the last little while. It's really fun to hear about leadership. There, there isn't enough research and writing on leadership in the investment business. And so in that sense, uh, you know, the call to action here is like, let, let's go out and start quantifying. What does it mean to be a good leader and how do we deliver performance? Um, and, and so there you go. There's Kaya's next project. Instead of portfolio for the future, it's you know, leading to new investment models. Excellent. Okay. Leading to new investment models is the term and we'll give that some thought in our papers for this year, Ashby. Thank you. Josh, what's your thoughts? Oh, I would just reiterate Ashby's point. The fact that leadership is the most important component of operational alpha, but it's probably the least research from a quantified perspective. Um, and I think with that throws up huge opportunity to focus on improving governance, people across that chain. And I think very excited in the next couple of years as investors and LPs and GPs aim to kind of improve that and connect that value chain from, from LP down to portfolio company. 
Yeah, all about the people, right? That human touch ain't going to go anywhere. And in fact, just becomes much, much more important. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think there's some amazing things that are happening and changing in our world. And it's all about the people. Um, thank you, Josh. Um, Ashby, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you both. You've been exceptionally, and Doggy down there as well. You've both been exceptionally great in your contribution. So those on the phone that have joined us today, thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful to have you. I didn't get to all of your questions, but we'll attempt to address those after. Ashby, Josh, Teneo partners, wonderful to work with you here. And Ashby, great to have you on the phone today. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thank Happy you. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.